Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 725 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today on the show, we'll be speaking with Christina. Now, Christina is the mother of a child with type 1 diabetes, and she's a teacher. So we're going to get her teacher mom perspective today. While you're listening, please don't forget. Just don't forget while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan or becoming bold with insulin. I'm going to say it again because it has to be said. If you're a... Mm, I messed up. I'll try again. If you're a U.S. resident who has type 1 diabetes or is the caregiver of someone with type 1, please go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Join the registry, fill out the survey, answer the easy questions. It's completely HIPAA compliant and absolutely anonymous. When you answer these questions, you'll be helping other people with type 1 diabetes. You'll be helping the show and you just might be helping yourself. Go see how. T1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. The podcast is also sponsored by Touched by Type 1. Head to touchedbytype1.org to learn more. And today's program, that's what my grandmother would have called it, a program. I don't know why she'd say, I'm going to sit down and watch my programs. I, I mean, I don't know. She was from a different time. Anyway, the program is also sponsored today by U.S. Med. U.S. Med is a distributor of diabetes supplies. It's where I get Arden's Omnipods. And it's where I get Arden's Dexcoms. You can get your things there as well. Go to usmed.com forward slash juice box or call 888-721-1514 to get your free benefits check. Thanks so much for supporting the sponsors. Now let me get you to the program. You know, in my mind now, I expect the Mandrell sisters to come out and sing or Lawrence Welk or something like that. The Seattle Aquarium. Oh, and uh, yeah, it was really active. It was like climbing all over the glass. So it's my favorite animal. Well, there you go. I was in yeah. Seattle this year and I didn't know they had an aquarium. Yeah, it's not huge. It's okay. I, it's, you know, it's important, but I don't, wouldn't say that you need to like go back specifically to see the aquarium. <laughs> well, if you enjoy them and you're ever in Georgia, the Atlanta Aquarium is is quite spectacular. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I will go. Yeah. Well. Do you have plans on leaving uh, for Georgia soon or no? I don't, no. but now I'm just going to go just for that. Feels like <laughs> feels like a hollow <laughs> promise to me. But um, I want to say I was there with my son when he was like 16, and he was uh, playing baseball. At the okay. end of this very long, very hot day, we had this little gap of time. It was the only time we could go to the Atlanta Aquarium. By the way, if you've never been there, their traffic is horrendous. Oh, no. So... <laughs> The aquarium's pretty close to the hotel, and I'm like, look, we have to go. You know, we're, we're going to go. We're here. We're this close to it. And he just, he did not want to. He fought it. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm tired. I'm hot. I just want to take a shower. I don't want to do oh. this. Like, he basically, like, looked at the floor the entire time we drove there. We were caught in horrendous traffic, turning what in any normal place would have been, like, a 15-minute ride into, like, a 45-minute ride to get No. There. Oh, no. <laughs> we get in there. And when we leave some hours later, he says to me in the parking garage, I'm glad you made me come to this. Oh, was that's n- good. Nicest concession he's ever made to me in my life on something like that. So well, that's awesome. That, that feels good as a parent. You need those moments. Brought this up to him recently. Doesn't particularly remember it. Of course. <laughs> uh, that's great. Yeah. So <laughs> That's all right. He'll probably have a similar experience at some point when the tables have flipped. Or I'm wasting my entire life. <laughs> yeah, I have those moments, those thoughts too. It's apparent. Like, why am I spending so much time on this? I, I get think, that. I used to take him to do like these most, like, I kept thinking of it as like, he'll never remember it when he was little, but it'll, 
it'll be the building blocks of who he is as he's growing up. And sometimes I'm like, I don't think that worked. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like my daughter just lost two, her first two teeth. And, uh, you know, it's like, do you, what do you, <laughs> cause our parents kept ours, you know? And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I didn't want my teeth, you know, I mean, like it was really strange when my parents handed me my teeth and were like, here you go. And I was like, that, that's, that was my part of my body. That's just really weird. It's just one of those things where you're like, I don't think this is going to be important to you. Christina, I need to tell you that I've been recording the entire time and um, starting to think (laughs) I'm leaving this in. So um, I'm going to tell you something right now. All right. I don't know why, but Kelly kept the kid's teeth. Okay. (laughs) Okay. And I didn't even know it was happening. And when I found out, I found it abhorrent. <laughs> and then she told the kids one day and they they shunned her. So <laughs> <laughs> So I made the good choice of throwing them out into the garden basically. <laughs> Although that could be creepy for someone else someday if they buy our house and find little baby teeth in our garden. <laughs> Wait a minute. You threw them in the garden? <laughs> I did. I don't know why, but it was like it feels less uh abrupt or like less crude than throwing them just in the trash i don't know why i was like i'll put them in the bushes i don't know (laughs) (laughs) that was like my middle ground i guess hilarious (laughs) yeah if we lived in a small community in the 1800s my children would have made kelly move just outside of the tree line after they told her that (laughs) right exactly (laughs) That's disgusting. And then she showed them and they were like, no, 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 Like, we don't care about this. Like, why are you showing this to us? Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Even like, I can understand. I, I, I think I took that opportunity afterwards to go, you know, some of the other things that you're saving to give them later, they don't want that either. Right. Yeah. And there's like, if you save everything, I, where do you possibly even put it all? You know, I, we have to actually hide when things when we, th- when we, you know, purge, we have to hide them from my daughter before we throw them away. Cause she wants to keep like everything. So maybe she would be one of those people that would want her baby teeth, but I really got to work on her right now about this. Cause she's going to be like a hoarder if I don't. Want. Yeah, it sounds like you're judging her, but you threw their teeth into a bush. So I'm not certain where this fault lies exactly. Um, <laughs> True, true. <laughs> I will finish by telling you that my mom is 79 now, and she just moved out of her home to a, a place where you know somebody can be with her a little more frequently. And she has this candle. It's a Christmas tree. And it's maybe, I mean, no lie, it's maybe about 18 inches high. It's the most mm. realistic looking candle I've ever seen in my life. And I remember it throughout my life. You know, like it's always been around as a decoration at Christmas. And my whole life I've thought, why don't we ever burn that candle? So we're we're cleaning up her apartment. She's there. And I'm like, you know, there's a lot of stuff she had to get rid of. She just doesn't have the space for it. And I said, Mom, what's the story with this candle? She goes, that's my mom's. And I flipped wow. it over on the bottom. The label on the bottom is actually made out of cloth. Whoa. And, and, and it's just, it's really old. And I said to her, I'm like, okay. She's, you know, I'm like, well, what do you want to do with it? She goes, I don't have any space for it. I said, I'm going to take it home. I said, but I'm going to burn it, but only on Christmas. Yeah. And she goes, okay. I said, so I'll have it for years. You know, we'll burn it on Christmas. So she was at my house on Christmas. I set the candle. I'm like, mom, I'm going to light the candle. Is that okay? Like, are you all right with this? Because most of what I'm thinking is the candle's neat and everything. But I mean, if I, if I turn to my kids 25 years from now and go, hey, this candle belonged to my mom and it belonged to her mom, they're going to throw it in the garbage. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> right. It's like you might as well just enjoy it. That's exactly you know? how it felt. I was like, why don't we just burn the candle and, and just enjoy it? And by the way, however long ago that candle was purchased, they made candles a lot better because oh, it, yeah. it, it didn't drip. It didn't smoke. It burned slowly. Um, we have apparently as Americans forgot how to make candles or we don't make them here anymore or something. Right, right. That's not surprising, unfortunately, but that's really cool. That'll be a really fun tradition. Yes, if I can remember where the damn candle is next year. We'll see how that goes. (laughs) The other challenge, yes. (laughs) Anyway, uh, Christine, you should probably introduce yourself. (laughs) Yes, yes. So uh, obviously my name is Christina and uh, my daughter Annie started kindergarten in August at the school where I also teach fifth grade. So I was hoping to kind of share a little bit about the start of her year in kindergarten and kind of what we're working on, challenges that we came up, you know, against and the hopes that that might help others prepare and get a little window into what to expect. What have I said to you? I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about candles and aquariums for the rest of the year. 
<laughs> I could probably do that. Yeah. No. No, no, no please. I could, but. <laughs> you could? <laughs> I, I probably could. I'm a chatty person. So. <laughs> well, perfect. Because <laughs> well, especially if it involved aquariums, because, you know, I do like marine biology, but. I guess we'll give other people a break. Yes, for sure. I will tell you, I think that what <laughs> sold my son on the Atlanta Aquarium was the beluga whales. Oh, my gosh. I've never, see, I've never seen those. Yeah, That's I think that might have been what did it. Um, anyway, pretty amazing. There's also like pretty a amazing. main tank in there that is so large that it's hard to wrap your head around. Um, oh, it's awesome. Okay, but that's not the point. The point is <laughs> you're, you, you made some babies. How many babies did we make? I've got two. two. So Annie is the eldest, and then Jack is uh, – well, he's a year and a half. Well, a little bit along. Well, she he'll be two in April, put it that way. Okay. And how old's Annie again? She will be six in June. So she's five now. Diagnosed when? She was diagnosed at two and a half. Okay. Three years. So mm-hmm. yeah, we just celebrated this last September, we just celebrated kind of like the tipping point, you know, where she's had diabetes in her life longer than not. Would you do fireworks? So. Um <laughs> um what did we? You would think I would remember what we did for her diversary, but it's kind of weird because of COVID. You know, like her last couple of diversaries have been pretty toned down. Like the first year, we went really big and we went to Canada, and we had like a three day weekend. And then after that, it was a little bit more scaled down. Um, but yeah, I think we just kind of went out. We always go out to dinner and have lots of. Des- it's we do like a weekend type of thing, so we have lots of dessert that weekend, and she gets a little. A little present and stuff and we just kind of make a big deal of it cool that's excellent well I, you live yeah. in seattle i wasn't sure maybe you took over a, a city block and moved into a bank or something like that but, right yeah I, I don't yeah know. and we um we actually live further north we live in uh bellingham area <laughs> christina trying to distance herself from craziness she's like i don't really live right there uh <laughs> Okay, seattle is amazing but it's actually where annie was born but there's so much traffic it's you know crazy it's just you lose like hours of your day in traffic so we couldn't do that i'm anymore. definitely too old to do that that's for sure um yeah. okay so any other type one or autoimmune issues in your family no um we ha- uh, type two runs on both sides i'm pre-diabetic um but not type one it was definitely out of the blue when she was first showing symptoms we didn't know what they were uh, we just kind of she had gotten sick and we she started drinking a lot of water was lethargic you know those common things and we just chalked it up to her kind of recovering she had never she's always had a really strong immune system and had never been to the doctor before ever um, before being um, admitted to the hospital so we just thought that her body was doing what it needed to do to recover from being sick and then she kept drinking more and more water and uh, we had luckily caught it before she went into ketoacidosis. So okay. we, you know, called our doctor and we're like, she's drinking a lot of water. She's wetting the bed, which at that point she was, you know, potty trained and all that jazz. And so it was abnormal for her. And uh, yeah, my, it was a kind of a dramatic event because my husband took her into our doctor and it was like right at the time when school started for me and the kids were starting to come into the classroom and I got a phone call from him saying, you know, he was very calm about it. He's been in like, he's been an EMT and a firefighter. And so he like very calmly using his like firefighter voice told me on the phone, you know, what was up? Like, we need to go to Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, They're saying that she has diabetes. And it was just this very crazy, dramatic thing where like the kids are coming to my classroom and I'm like running against the tide of students to the office. And I was like, I have to go now. (laughs) It was, um. It's always like imprinted on my memory, like trying to get down that hallway of students. So, but we did catch her early enough to where it wasn't dramatic. She didn't have to be in the ICU or anything. And I feel like overall, you know, our experience with it was pretty smooth as far as being, you know, she wasn't helicoptered out or anything like that. Right. Okay. Um, So some would uh, argue maybe her immune system too strong. Uh, Exactly. I know. (laughs) Seriously. And actually my, uh, my son has not gotten sick yet. Like he's, really i mean he may you know every once in a while he'll have a low grade fever maybe mm-hmm. and, but it makes me nervous now <laughs> yeah yeah no yeah when he like rubs his face on a glass door and you're just like oh he's fine doesn't matter he's licking handrails nothing happens and yeah, yeah. yes so well, well i, I yeah so let me say this <laughs> now i'm not pushing this on you but trial net is in your general area of the country 
like their oh, home, yes. the home office there. So if you wanted to mm-hmm. do that with, uh, I don't know if home office is the right uh, verbiage, but um, their hub. Yeah, I don't know. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we once he we actually have it in our notes at Seattle Children's that once he turns two, we're going to go ahead and do that. Go through that program. Yep. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. So um, very specifically, we're going to talk about your professional expertise and how it's intersecting with your parenting and then maybe some ideas that you might have uh, wrapped around both sides of it. So how long have you been a teacher? Okay. I think I know the answer to this question off the top of my head, but um, I have been a teacher for 11 years now. Okay. And you, you said you were teaching fifth grade at the time. Do you still teach fifth? When you have diabetes and use insulin, low blood sugar can happen when you don't expect it. Gvoke Hypopen is a ready-to-use glucagon option that can treat very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes ages 2 and above. Find out more. Go to gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with pheochromocytoma or insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk. Hey you, what's up? It's me again, Scott. I'm here to tell you about a place where you can get your diabetes supplies that might be, um, you know, better than where you get them now. US Med. US Med is where I'm getting Arden's Dexcom and Omnipod supplies from. I switched to US Med from the place that we were using before the same way you will. I went to a link on the internet, usmed.com forward slash juice box. Having said that, I could have called a phone number, 888 721 one five one four. You have your choice. I just sneezed unexpectedly. Don't worry, I edited it out. It would have blown your ears out. Sorry. Wow. I'm dizzy from it. Anyway, US Med, number one distributor for freestyle Libre systems nationwide. The number one specialty distributor for Omnipod Dash, number one fastest growing tandem distributor nationwide, the number one rated distributor in Dexcom customer satisfaction surveys. Oh my goodness. Could there possibly be more, Scott? There is. With over 1 million diabetes customers served since 1996, U.S. Med wants to give you better service and better care. They're going to do that by always providing you with 90 days worth of supplies and fast and free shipping. They carry everything from insulin pumps and diabetes testing supplies to the latest in CGMs, like the Freestyle Libre 2 and Dexcom G6. U.S. Med accepts Medicare nationwide and over 800 private insurers. Are you having trouble finding a place that has Omnipod 5? That's where I got Omnipod 5 from, U.S. Med. Need to know more? USmed.com forward slash juice box. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting the show. Let's get back to Christina. Yep, okay. still fifth. Um, I wonder if the kids remember the day you weren't there. <laughs> You know, probably, um, probably not. They they probably don't remember anything. But, I know. It's yeah. probably like your son. They're like, what are you talking about? Like this massive life event for me is probably like, eh. <laughs> Can I just check with something real quickly? When you are absent one day or you just take a day off absent, like you're not an adult. Like say you just take the day off. Um, what do they do with your kids? Do they bring in someone to teach them or do they put them in a closet for the day? How do they handle <laughs> the children? Um, yeah, you have to get a substitute teacher. And it's actually a lot of work. So teachers don't often, you know, this year's kind of different with COVID, but, um, you know, that's why you get teachers coming in, they're sick, they're coming in like at death's door, because it's almost just more work to make sub plans, because you have to like, write out every step of like every minute that a guest teacher's in your room, what they do, prep everything. It's a ton of work. Mm, Okay. My daughter's high school now doesn't even bother with it, which I find disturbing. Um, Interesting. So if your teacher is not there that day, they send you to a common area and you sit there and stare at something for an hour. That's bizarre. Do they have subs, like shortages or something? I don't know. There used to be subs. And a few years ago, this started happening. Weird. And now the teachers tell the kids like, hey, I'm taking off tomorrow. Oh, that's (laughs) that's uh, that's interesting. (laughs) No, it's not interesting. It's this. It's defeating. I we I'm paying the property taxes here for that school. And. Yeah, that's a different system. I have not heard of that. Yeah, this is how it's being handled. Now, the teacher can't come. That's okay. Just sit there. 
So interesting. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I haven't heard of that. No, that's not a common practice over right, here. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, all right. I, I want to start, I guess, with, so your daughter's going into school now, into kindergarten? Yeah. Okay. And let's start from your perspective as a mom. Like, what was there to do as she went into school around diabetes? So we, first of all, I started having a lot of anxiety. I, I think I'd want to, like, I think I want to start with that because um, I, you know, Annie is a really strong confident young lady has always made friends really easily. I've never worried about her socially. And even with that, around like three months before kindergarten started, I started having just not, you know, waking up at night, worried anxiety about the transition. And I think what I was most worried about was, you know, her, I had these like images of her going in, her alarms going off and being kind of like kids kind of judging her, being wanting to separate themselves from her, excluding her because of her diabetes. And um, so the first thing that I did when I started experiencing that was I reached out to our team at Seattle Children's and I asked them to, to connect me with some families whose kids had gone through kindergarten um, so that I could kind of ease some of that and get a more realistic picture of what other experiences were, which is also one of the reasons why I wanted to come onto the podcast too, because it was really helpful when I was able to reach out to some of those families and say, hey, did they did your child experience this? And the overwhelming response that I got, and I'm not saying this is true for everyone, was that it was, a, it was you know, as far as the acceptance socially, it was very smooth. There are a lot of other kids who have special needs in classes and in kindergarten, everyone's just kind of on even playing field. Mm-hmm. So that made me feel a lot better. And I would recommend that any other families who are experiencing that um, also kind of reach out. We don't have a huge community up here um, in Seattle. There's a big community, you know, type one community, but up here, not so much. And so it really is kind of like a little bit lonely. Like Annie didn't, we actually just recently met some other type ones her age, but up until even a month ago, you know, it was just kind of us. So I didn't really have anyone to compare to. Mm-hmm. Um, so after I kind of worked through that a little bit in June, we met, I met with um, over Zoom with the nurse and we started setting up some preliminary information to start getting the 504 going so that she could work on it, write it up. And then we also needed to, as part of that, we needed to get our paperwork from Seattle Children's that has um, what they call standing order. So you know, what kind of directions for how to address her needs at school, but it has to, had to come from the, from them. And all of that gets it worked into the 504. And then we met again in August before school started to go over that written plan to sign it, et cetera. So that's kind of like the quick little overview of the setup. So, you know, check in and the you know before the school year ends prior to start getting that ball rolling is what I would recommend. Yeah, you know it's funny as a person who's now had a kid with diabetes go completely through school. Like Arden's a senior now, and she started school with diabetes. I like my first inclination is almost not to laugh at you, but to be like, oh, it'll be okay, don't worry about it. And you, you know, like I I know you're going to, but then. I remembered that I think I went into the school like nine months before Arden's school year started to try to get a 504 plan. Yeah, yeah. And they were like, why are you here? Well, they looked at me (laughs) very strangely, yes. And um, uh, they didn't kick me out, but they were like, no, like, we don't do that now. Come back. Well, and two, especially right now, because school nurses are so overloaded with COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm really glad that we, and she had reached out to me because of that reason, um, you know, there's just a lot going on for school nurses in their world right now. I don't know how she's amazing. That's all I have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it it helped to just get the get things started a little bit earlier. Okay, I, I um I would have to say that I guess I'm interested. Let me just change my 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 thought here for a second. I'm more interested in now that you've seen the whole thing be set up. How many times have you been handed a 504 as a teacher? Oh, frequently. <laughs> And Excuse what, me. Um, what really happens? Like, do you just kind of like, yeah. listen, do you just kind of like look at it and go, oh, a kid got asthma? And then you stick it in a drawer? Or do you really read it? Or like, how valuable are they? Um, I think it depends on the severity of the diagnosis. So, f- for instance, because a 504 is, is used for a large range of things. Mm-hmm. Um, 
<clears throat> what I most commonly use C504 for are um, like learning disorders. So things like, you know, if a student has ADHD or some or something along those lines, it could be asthma related. Yeah. Um, and in general, in f- I would say in fifth grade, it's a little bit different because fifth graders are much more able to manage themselves. So, for instance, if a student has asthma, it's they're much better about saying, I need to use my inhaler right now versus, you know, if you were in a kindergarten class and the kid is unaware that they need their inhaler and might be like wheezing, you know, mm-hmm. um, get to a point where they're wheezing. So, and when it comes to learning, um, you know, accommodations for learning, that's where it's nice to have that copy. You know, I have like a binder that I use that's right in front of me and I have students who, you know, every year who need special education services and they have accommodations. And I think, it depends on the teacher, perhaps, but I'm constantly kind of flipping back and forth to those to make sure that I'm following them. So even even when it comes to like when I'm making a new seating chart, you know, making sure that I'm following that plan and if there's like preferential seating following through. But that being said, I teach fifth grade. I have one group of kids. And if I, you know, was teaching middle school or high school, you've got a lot more kids. Yeah, it's a lot harder to manage. And I think it's really important to teach kids to um to advocate for themselves, even from a young age. And I, we're already teaching Annie that as yeah. well. I, br- I bring it up because one of the things that I kind of see online frequently is newer diagnosed people send their kids off. Oh, hold on a second. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure just what happened there. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, going to get some water while I try to hold on to my idea. So I see newer diagnosed kids, right? And their parents have set up this 504 plan. And then something doesn't happen in the 504 plan. And they kind of lose their shit a little bit. You, mm-hmm. you, know, you know what I mean? Like, and sometimes it could be, I don't want to say inconsequential things, but sometimes it's smaller stuff. Mm-hmm. You, you know, like, it's not like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I want the kid tested, you know, blood sugar tested, you know, alarms being treated properly, you know, blood sugars being handled. Like, all the, like, the, like, do or die stuff obviously can't get ignored. But when it's some, like, little weird thing you put in your 504 plan and they didn't do it and then they start running around, you know, yelling about, like, we could sue over this. I was like, I don't know what this is. doesn't even seem important to me. You you, you know what I mean? Like, I think that sometimes... You know, I've only spoken about this a handful of times probably on the podcast, but my thought process going into the school, uh, sans the first time when I went in like a year before Arden was going to be in kindergarten, was I I guess I realized in that first meeting, they looked at me like I was out of my mind. And I Mm. thought, I don't want to be the crazy parent. Like, 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 because, you know, once you leave the school, they're just, they're people at their job. And, mm-hmm. you know, when I walked out, my imagination told me that they stood in that office and they were like, what is wrong with that guy? <laughs> you know, and um, yeah. and I thought, I don't want this to be the case. I don't want it to be adversarial. And I yeah. don't want them to think of me as like reactionary and, and overreacting. Yeah. So I was oh, yeah. con- cognizant about like keeping the 504 plan thoughtful, but simple and mm-hmm. followable. And then I just realized at one point, like you can't. Like, even if you read it, it's not like it means anything to you if you don't know about diabetes. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such a complicated disease, right? It's not, it's not like um, you take an inhaler when you have a symptom. It's, you know, it's an, it's such an ongoing management throughout the day. Um, And I, I agree with you. Like, even when I, even with frequently looking at this stuff, there's absolutely times where I'm going to forget, because I think one thing that's really important to remember is that it's such, the classroom is such a dynamic space. And you have kids who are in the room that have all kinds of needs. And it's not always, um, it's not always physical, right? So, especially, you know, this is a great example. We have a lot of kids who are experiencing trauma, anxiety, depression, you know, who were already experiencing those things and then put a pandemic and isolation on top of it. It's, you know, really, really traumatizing. Right. And then, um, and then, so you're trying to manage all of their needs, their academic sides, but you're also trying to manage the whole child and think about what they need social, emotionally in order to be just like a good person in society. 
And so you're trying to meet those needs in addition to the layering on top of needs that are in a 504. And then every day is just really different. And so the thing that I love about teaching is that you go in and your day yesterday is not going to be the same as the one that you're having today. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's great. And sometimes that really is challenging. Um, But it, it does, there's so much variability that again, I think it kind of, I think what you're saying is spot on and that you got to be careful about, um, you want to think about the battles, what you're, what you're kind of highlighting most or the battles that you're choosing. And, and that that was one of the things that I was going to talk about too, is just that we've absolutely had to change some things, um, from how we expected them to go. So, right. So for instance, I can kind of tell you a little bit about how we have it running and then some of the challenges we came across. Um, yeah. Can I just if, jump in before? Yeah. I, I do want to hear that, but I want to say first, like yeah. you, you got a, like when you went to college, you're, you have an undergrad in what? What's your undergrad in? So I have a bachelor's in English and comparative literature, and then I have a master's in education and a, um, my multiple subject teaching credential and my single subject teaching right. credential. You in didn't English. take any nursing classes? I know. No. <laughs> no. Did you no. pre med? No. Mm-mm. How about psych? Did you take any psychology <laughs> classes? No. No. Uh, so you, are you trying to say that a bunch of children come together that have a lot of needs that, you know, nobody's really qualified to help with like you're you're qualified to teach them and then they they show up with all these other needs i think it's just very important for the parents to remember that you're not sending your you know i don't know your shy kid to a psychologist you're sending them to an education major and and there's right. you know and you're not sending and and by the way too how often do we talk about on here how nurses don't get any training around diabetes? Oh my goodness! <laughs> so, so, yeah. so you know, mm-hmm. do you think they tell teachers about it? <laughs> right, or you know, or even like it, it's very rare to find a school where there's a full time nurse just dedicated to that one school. Yeah. So their caseload is usually spread across several schools. Right. You know, and that's that itself is a challenge. They're not always on your child's campus. Right. I think the last thing I want to add before you you move on is that we are in a really wonderful time around diabetes where everything is obvious to you. Like I can pick up my phone right now and I can swipe up and tell you that Arden's blood sugar is 91. It looks pretty stable to me. And, Mm -hmm. and like, I know that in the blink of an eye, but hundreds of thousands, if not millions of children before your kids went to school with diabetes and they didn't have a CGM or some of them didn't even have a meter, You, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe their long-term health won't be the greatest uh, compared to yours, but they did live through fourth grade. So, right. you know, I think there's a way to, there's a way to, huh, what do I want to say here, Christina? I don't want to be too <laughs> antagonistic. Um, sometimes you got to not want to be upset. Does that yeah. make sense? You have to want to not be upset. Like it's sometimes it's too easy to want to want the fight. And, yeah. and that's, it, that's just my opinion. My opinion is you're looking for harmony and as much understanding as you can get given the situation. I don't know. Yeah. And I think we, we, you know, I think we're used to having to do a lot of fighting, especially with like insurance and, you know, pushing back against, you know, like I know that we have done a lot of pushback with even just her diabetes care team around her higher blood sugars and said like no you know we want to get them lower that kind of thing Mm -hmm. um and so i think it i think i think too we're just we're that's our kind of our natural trigger and it does take a while to kind of bring it down and i had to work on that this year too and it was a kind of good that i knew you know i'm obviously my they're my colleagues (laughs) that i'm working with and so it was kind of nice to have that because i was able to kind of stand back and tell and you know remind myself this isn't just the school nurse this is so and so I know them. I have a history with them. I know that their heart's in a good place. I know all of these things, and I and I'm able to kind of step back a little bit more. Yeah, and trust. Um, so, so you think it's easier? It might be easier for a stranger to look at the school nurse and think she's trying to screw us, whereas you look at the school nurse and you're like, "That's Pat." You, 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 is right. that kind of, and Pat's a decent person, and I've seen them work very hard at their job, and I know they're not trying to mess with us. And right. you have a little right. more familiarity, so everyone. You know, I think you have to just assume that 
in all these situations until it's proven over. I'm not saying, look, there are people of horrendous stories about school. I'm certainly mm-hmm. not lumping them into this right, like, little bit of, of the conversation here. But there are you, times to be upset. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and please, and I, you know, at some point in this conversation, will tell you about, you know, when I got very upset and did something. But um, I, I'm just saying, like, don't want the fight. Like, want it, yeah. to, go, want it to go well. And if they don't get it right away, I wouldn't take that as being as them being adversarial. I would take that right. as them not understanding. That's my point. Yes, absolutely. And I, I, I think that's a huge point that I want to drive home to is like, ex, ex, well, I'll, I guess I'll wait till I go through our process. Good. But I do want to talk about that for yeah, sure. Tell me about the process used. Okay, well, I'll tell you kind of how how we decided the you know the system that we decided to try out, and then I'll tell you like the challenges that we came across. Mm-hmm. Um, so how it goes for us is uh, last summer before COVID, like Delta got all crazy again. But um, Annie went to this science camp, and um, I was I wanted to do that because I wanted to just practice her being away from me with a team that doesn't know anything about diabetes just to see how it would go and it went really well it was great but the system that we had with them was that they would just take a quick little picture of our pump and text it to us before snack or whatever and then we would give directions or if an alarm went off we would they would take a little picture and send it to us at that point we were using medtronic and um there you know we could follow her but there's always a huge delay so uh, sometimes up to 20 minutes you know if she goes low or something we wouldn't find out on our phones until like 20 minutes later on so we used that system so it was a little more real time for them um and we actually came up with that because i remember the episode where you were talking about how you had this realization that you could just text arden and she could you know text you back what her blood sugar number was or whatever mm-hmm. <laughs> and i was like oh well let's try that so we use that same system at the school. We have like a group thread going that has, um, you know, parents, the teacher, school nurse. And then she also has some individual paras who are like support people to school who, you know, check in with her at key parts every day when things are a little bit crazy for the teacher. And he's got a lot to manage just to as a check in point. So yeah, what what happens is the teacher or whoever is checking in with her will take a picture of her phone, which isn't as necessary anymore because we we're now on Dexcom and Omnipod, but I'll get there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and they send it to us and a snapshot of the phone and we give dosing advice or, you know, so might say, okay, go ahead and have her put in her number and dose for uh, 15 minutes before eating or something like that. Mm-hmm. They do the same if there's an alarm. We'll say, all right, go ahead and give her the applesauce or something like that. Um, When we send her to school, her lunches and snacks have like a little sticky note on it that have the carbs. And then for her lunch, we'll actually write down like how much each item has so that they know how much to make up type of thing. Um, So if she doesn't eat her carrots or something, which wouldn't be that big of a deal, but if she didn't eat her carrots, you know, we, we would know that she needs to make up like two grams or something. Yeah. And then we keep extra supplies at the school, like, you know, all of her extra, um, especially since I'm there, you know, I've got insulin in the fridge, I've got sight changes and stuff in my room, and we definitely have had to do that so far at school. And then of just, of course, extra snacks and juice and stuff. Um, the interesting thing is that Annie has to be the one to push any buttons in her pump. And this I have heard is different across schools. I don't mind it. It's fine because Annie's pretty savvy and she does, you know, she, t- she does little things here and there with her care. And I know that'll increase, mm-hmm. but she, you know, they supervise her, but they can't push anything into her pump. She has to be the one to do it. So <laughs> another thing too, yeah. is that they're not comfortable doing any kind of temp bolus. So like, if I want to do a temp bolus, I've got to like go in there, have them bring her over and set it. All right. So that's where, so that little bit, I could see people getting pissed about that. So the the whole thing about like you know your daughter's six, five, and you know like she, oh she has to push the buttons, which means we think if this kills her, it'll be harder for you to sue us if she pushes the buttons. It's different, yeah. It's yeah. different. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, come on. You know the reasoning there. for it. I haven't asked, but it, <laughs> it, it, it's okay for us because. And he was already doing that. Uh, like, I, we already, but I don't mind she's also it. really good with her numbers. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know. I see what you're saying. Like, well, first of all, I don't mind that they do that. I just, I don't, I don't like that it gets 
Like, let's not pretend. Like, just say it. You, you know the, what re- I mean? the reasons behind it. Yeah. Yes, and, for and, sure. And the other right. thing is, too, you could have a kid who's not good with that. And then we, exactly. have, a, we have a problem now. Right, exactly. Which is why, you know, she's always, she's always monitored when she's doing it. So she's never like just handed her pump and told to put it in. She's always the one, like there's always someone watching her and like making sure it's all good. But she's fast too. And one that's actually been a stressor for some people at the school is that she'll put in her numbers really quickly and click, you know, to bolus. And they're like, wait, 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 what did you put in? You know? Yeah. Well, so. then that shows me the system's pretty imperfect on, on that, that specific scenario. <laughs> I, I, I want to stop for a second and ask, um, are you uh, generally, what is the word I'm looking for, nervous about other things? Or is this just this one thing that got you as she was going off to school? As far as being nervous about the social part? Yeah. Like when you were, when you talked about that, I, I know I don't want to get too far away from it. Like when you talked about all that like concern and we worry about what would happen, like I just, mm-hmm. I'm a boy, Christina. Like I don't worry about things that might happen. I worry about mm-hmm. things that are happening. And right. so like it's just, it's a different way of thinking. I probably yeah. not specific to boys and girls i'm just i was just trying to say that i'm a simple minded person uh but you don't, um, you don't worry about it yeah, until yeah. It's actually I, happening. I don't worry yeah. about things till they're going wrong now there's um you know okay there's i still pre-planned i did a ton mm-hmm. of pre-planning to send arden to school but i was never worried about it and like that's an interesting thing like i've never worried about like if people would like her or not like her or give mm-hmm. her problems and i don't know i just like, was that something that, like, do you worry about a lot of things, I guess is my question, or is, is there something specific about this? I would say that in general, like, I would say that my husband's probably more along your lines, a little bit less worried. I come from a family with high anxiety. I do a lot to, like, I do a lot to recognize it when I have anxiety and take steps to mitigate it, like reaching out to families being like, I, I was understanding I'm having this like movie going through my head that's probably very unrealistic and I'm going to go ahead and reach out and so I can stop that movie playing in my head. And I also didn't really have any reason to be thinking that because I'm a teacher, I'm in the classroom, I see kids interact and, you know, I don't see that, you yeah. know, but it was still a narrative almost that I had running through my head. So, yeah, I would say that. It depends. I, I think that there are certain things that I get a little more anxious over than others. Um, See, and that's such a good point. I couldn't even think of the word anxious. <laughs> that's what I meant to say. And I couldn't even come up with the word. <laughs> so were you, yeah. how was your experience as a child? My experience as a child was uh, in school. <laughs> yeah. It was, um, I was, I was strong in school. I definitely got, I moved around a little bit. I definitely got some social like teasing. I don't even know if I would call it bullying. Yeah. I think I would actually call it bullying. So um, I think that that was probably just something that was a little bit more on my mind. Mm, okay. That's, I just, yeah. thank you. I should have asked you that 20 yeah. minutes ago, but oh, it's fine. Um, okay. So you have a, a, a pretty good system set up with school. You know, you're sending photos back and forth so you can see what food's been eaten. Does that end up working for you? Yeah, that's that's actually working out pretty well. The other thing too that's nice about it is that she receives all of her care in class. I didn't want her leaving to go to the office every time yeah. an alarm goes off or she needed to check her BG or whatever. She she does everything in class and that has helped enable that too. Just open up that it it's all it's nice because everybody is on the same page. It feels very cohesive like we're a team. And it feels like there's this nice net of people who are supporting each other, basically. Yeah, I am a big proponent of it all happening in the classroom as well. I feel yes. there's a lot to be lost in the walking around the school. And, yep. you know, I'm sure I've told the story on here a million times, but leaving second grade, we thought Arden had a yeah. serious math deficiency. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that she was just going for like a, a scheduled blood sugar check. At the yeah. same time every day, and it was co- it was it was corresponding with the math lesson. Yeah, and the office is a busy place. It's so the, the people in the front office they do so much. Mm-hmm. So you know you might have a child who's you know unless she's going low or something that's not an immediate emergency you might sit there for ten minutes. You know what I mean? Right. While they're dealing with other things. Yeah, so. yeah. Maybe maybe it would be better just to react and handle it right there. But do you? But can you possibly? 
I mean, is it possible that one day you could run into a teacher who says, look, I don't want to be responsible for that? Absolutely. Yes. That uh, Part of the reason why this is working is that the team is on board. So her teacher has been amazing and he has um, been all for it. And I think in some ways, um, okay, so he sets timers on his phone at key times during the day mm-hmm. um, to just check in with her, you know, Dexcom and check in with us. So it's very structured. um, And I think in a lot of ways, it's nice for them not to have to make the decision about what to do because we are telling them what to do. So it takes some of the the pressure of, okay, she's going low. How much do we give, et cetera, off. Um, That's, that's been good. I mean, one of the drawbacks though, is that it is an interruption to him like his flow of like the classroom which is why they ended up bringing in a couple of folks to help with just some some times of the day that were a little bit busier for him to where he wouldn't need to stop the flow in like a key part of the class there are as a teacher there are just certain times of day that are a little bit more crazy and so we were able to mitigate the interruption by just bringing someone else in and it's fun because there's more people on the team that can help out so that if there's one person gone, everyone else knows how, what to do and how to respond. How did you end up getting them to pay for another person to be in the room? So we are a title one school and we receive additional funds. So there's these amazing people called, they call them paras and they're there as support um, for kids in academics primarily. Um, but they're also the people who are our yard supervisors. They fill lots of different roles and, uh, it's like a five, their, their day is very scheduled out. So like from this time to this time, they're doing math support, for instance, for K1. And then from this time to this time, they're outside on the playground. And what they did is they just built in a five minute chunk of time, you know, across a couple of their, the Paris days to just do a quick check-in with Annie. And it's just very, very quick. So there's no like person sitting in the corner of the room, like a broom no. wait, waiting to be needed or something like nope. that. Right? It would be as if the, the person who's out on yard, you know, yard supervision, when they come in, they just check in with Annie real quick and then go back out. It's, it's very quick. Mm-hmm. It's not like a, yeah, it's not like paying for an additional person to be on People who are already at the school, they just have that one quick check-in built into their day. That's excellent. Like when Arden was young, they just, that didn't exist. Yeah. There was like you, like quite literally had to hire a person to be in the room. Right. Right. And that school was never going to do that for Arden. That's for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I feel, I don't know if that would be possible at every school, um, but it's, it's been, it's been really amazing. And, and I, and he feels very connected to her team. So that's been yeah. really good. And it, you know, like I said, she did, she hasn't had to go to the office really at all, like so far this year, which is great. And if, if there have been a lot of challenges. So basically, you know, everything around diabetes is based on patterns and everything changed when she went to kindergarten. I don't know if you remember this with happening with Arden, but sure. it's like when the times that she eats, her snack times, her periods of active play completely changed. Mm-hmm. And the type of outdoor play change, she had, she was in preschool before this, but they didn't have, you know, a big playground that they're running around and playing on. And typically when we would go to the playground, when she uses lots of muscle groups and is running around, she just like her blood sugar just tanks. So usually we'd have to give her like a good 15 to 20 grams uncovered before we go to the playground just to keep her even. Mm-hmm. And so that has been what we've been experiencing pretty much right from the beginning of the year is that she was kind of constantly going low and um, that, that was challenging, obviously on the team, on the teacher, it was really stressful, especially with, you know, it's a very, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of, it's a very scary diagnosis, right? For people, it's a, it's an intimidating diagnosis in general and stressful for us. But especially for people who feel, you know, are at the school and feel like they're responsible for her not dying, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, there's definitely this urgency to it to where it's pretty stressful. So there's been a lot of adjustment that's had to go on. Um, They at one point asked us to, her high alarm goes off at one, originally was going off at 140. And that was also stressful. The team was, you had had, um, experience with type one before, but not with um, like a CGM or a pump. So it's a different kind of stress, right? In that 
it's awesome to know their number. It's also a lot of information and the alarms that were going off can be very, you know, triggering and scary. So um, they asked us, you know, to basically bring up that bring up that high alarm. And that was really, really tough. I had a hard time with that. I I was actually kind of really surprised (laughs) at the emotional reaction that I had to it. And in some ways it kind of felt like I had failed or that like me, I felt judged. I I guess kind of like that feeling you were describing when you came in that first meeting and walked out feeling like they think you're crazy. You know, I kind of felt that way. Like maybe people were thinking that I couldn't take care of her. I felt a lot of shame about her blood sugar numbers and and I had a lot of like anxiety about the stress and or the perceived stress and burden that I thought it was putting on people. See, this is where you and I will like, like we have different, we're from different like generations because I heard that and I was like, whoa, I don't care. Like somebody, <laughs> like that's your job and someone's paying you with the thing stresses you out, see a therapist. Uh, but I'm not putting my kid's <laughs> blood sugar higher for you. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a generational like disconnect for me. I, I well, mean- and- that would be yeah. like if my garbage man said to me, it's so hard to lift up this trash. I'd be like, well, you might not want to be a garbage man then. You, you know, like, like seriously, like I'd be like, dude, that's part of the job. You know, like, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's interesting because when I hear type ones talk about judgment, when they go to the doctor, you know, when they have to, sh- when they're showing their CGM, it was kind of like that. It was, it was really frustrating because before she went to kindergarten, her, she was very, very stable. Her numbers looked great. And then all of a sudden it was like, what is happening? Um, it just made her care a lot more public. And it, I just felt kind of naked about the whole thing. And, mm-hmm. um, no, and I, it's interesting I because aspect of it, I really do. Uh, yeah, 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 it's, it is, it's feel, you feel very naked and you feel like, you almost feel like you want to like defend yourself. Like I promise we are really good at this, but we're just, and one thing that I kept, I think that was really helpful is reminding everyone that we're in the data collecting stage. Um, and that kind of helped them and me in the sense that, you know, I had to remind them, you know, everything is about pattern with type one, everything's changing with her schedule. We're collecting data right now. We're constantly changing little things in her pump. Um, we'll get there. But we need information to see like how her body's reacting to situations because she also has PE now, you know, a lot more physical exercises. She has, you know, she's constantly doing like up and down movement, lots of thought of dancing and total physical response in kindergarten. And so it just has been really, really interesting. And then on top of that, um, you know, I think she's just going through a ton of growth. Like I can see it in yeah. her she is shooting up <laughs> she's lost two teeth there as i said Do you <laughs> that are now in the bushes <laughs> she's growing new ones in and um i can just see her physically changing yeah. at an incredible rate do you remember this with arden at of, all of course do you think like, fi- like five is nuts <laughs> do you think that you care more about how the teachers feel because you know them um no, I don't think so. I actually think it's easier for me to talk to them in about it. I think, you know what I think, I, I think that there's a lot more trust because I know them and vice versa. So I think when I'm telling them, you know, um, this is a data collecting stage, we're getting information, we see the number, we just, it just gives us information to tell how to react to it. I think that that has actually been helpful knowing them because I think that there is trust there. Um, and, and, and the other interesting thing too is like, so we, okay. So we brought up her high alarm to 180, but the reason why I was okay with that was because we have such a strong check-in system that they're not just like letting her fly all day, right? Yeah. Like there's there's check-in times built into the day. She never gets up to 180, really, right. unless no. she's got a sight failure, which we started, ex- that's another thing that happened. She started having increased sight failure. She was on the Medtronic pump mm-hmm. and they changed the, we were on the Mio sites, infusion sites, and they just weren't working for us. So we were, um, that had happened right around the time that she entered kindergarten and we just started getting high blood sugars at school. It was really weird. And um, we ended up deciding Medtronic isn't working for us anymore. And we decided to switch her to Omnipod early. We were planning on switching her during the summer, but we just said, you know, this is like a nightmare. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm having to do site changes at school all the time. Like we're just going to change her. And that also was another big transition because um, Omnipod 
how they like their dosing increments for basal are different. And so that yeah, it, is, it was kind of like trying to figure everything out again. Yeah, you're starting bit. over a little bit. I, yeah. I'm doing my best to get past like, I know I'm 50 and I don't know how old you are, but I, and I grew up on the, maybe the East coast and you grew up on the West coast, but I'm literally stuck on the beeping makes me stressed out. I, I swear to God, <laughs> if any one of my kids teachers ever says something like that to me, they're not going to like where the conversation goes after that. And I'm going to lose <laughs> a lot of academic or uh, intellectual uh, cred <laughs> because I'm going to lose my shit. If someone says something like that to me, I'm be like, Oh no, the beeping's bothering you. She's got diabetes. You moron. Like, like this is the situation. And I don't care how you feel. Like I, this is probably a good time for me to tell this story. So when Arden was first in school, we had a system set up as well. And I want everyone to remember Arden didn't have a CGM back then. She was on, um, you know, injections. And we had this system set up too. At certain times, certain things had to happen. There was this one time before recess during the day, she had to go to the nurse to get checked. And then we would kind of like bump her around with food if we had to before she went out. So for all of you who are wearing Dexcoms, you know, keep this keep this idea in mind. It's Arden going to the nurse. She's five years old, same age as Christina's daughter now. And it just doesn't happen one day. So one day the, the nursing staff doesn't call the classroom and ask for Arden to come down, which was the process. The teacher who had at that point had Arden for three quarters of a year, just, you know, doesn't notice it. The kids go out on the playground but I know because I know the schedule. And back then, Scott paid attention like a like laser focused. So what would happen was they'd call her down to the office. They'd check her number. They would call me on the phone. And then I would tell them what to do. And this happened every day before recess. So a couple minutes after recess goes by, I don't get the phone call. I try to be reasonable. Ten minutes later, I call the school. I get put through the nurse's office. I'm like, hey, I did not get my call about Arden pre-recess and the woman uh, the the nurse who i still know is like a friendly like neighbor um i just heard her go oh arden and then she hung up the phone and i was like what <laughs> so <laughs> now i'm sitting there like she hung up on me and i'm sitting there and five minutes later the call comes hey arden's blood sugar is like 50 um Another student came into the nurse's office with an emergency around his heart. They had to put him on a heart monitor at the exact time they were supposed to call and have Arden right. brought down. And so <clears throat> I had been telling them that this process that we set up wasn't good enough for ever, and they would ignore me. This is the day that Arden got somebody to help her with this, and we took it off the nurse because I... Uh, after Arden was okay, put myself in my car, drove over to the high school where the superintendent worked, uh, walked into his office, demanded to see him, sat in his outer office until he saw me, sat down, explained the whole thing to him, and then said, do you think it would be cheaper to hire an aide or for me to sue you when my daughter dies? Which do you think would be easier for you? I was like, because if you guys kill my kid... I'm going to spend the rest of what I'm assuming is going to be a long and sad life making you miserable. And I just want to be clear that I'm not that person today, but I think I would be that person later. So, um, right. <laughs> and then he goes, yeah, we'll get her an aid. I was like, great. There we go. Like, so Arden had to almost pass out. By the way, they found her on the monkey bars with her 50 blood sugar. Like, oh, like, up yes. on the, like up on the monkey bars. So if someone were to say to me, the beeping makes me nervous. I think I would laugh at them. And I'm feeling bad about that as I'm having that thought. Right. But, well, and yeah. two, I mean, so, so there you were advocating for your kiddo. Um, <laughs> and also I think for me, it didn't really put me off when they for so first of all, they didn't, they weren't necessarily telling me in those words, you know, the beeping is stressful. That's my teacher perspective coming in okay. and knowing what it's like to be teaching class and then to have to have a lot of interruptions, whether it's beeping or some other. I mean, there's a thousand things that interrupt you teaching mm -hmm. in a day. So I just want to be clear that that was not like the teachers complaining, but just that uh, they did. They did talk about how the alarm seemed like unnecessarily low, like when it was going off because we um, 
because we're, we are checking with her so often. So, and that's why, like I said, I was okay with like doing that system. And that, that has worked out. Bringing it up to 180 has no, been totally it, fine. It's lovely that you guys found a, like a work around that worked for everybody. Yes. I think that's amazing. And, you know, but I would tell you that I was once told, you know, well, we're not going to correct Arden's blood sugar. That's not what we do with the other type ones. And I was like, so there are four type ones walking around the school who have A1Cs and the eights, and you want me to shoot for that? Like, right. Like, and that yeah. that actually we did talk about as well, because I, as part of the conversation about raising up her, um, you know, her high alarm, that was brought up. Like, she's the most managed type one that we have. And, you know, and just kind of saying that, you know, most, most kids, their high alarm goes off at 200 or something. And I said, well, that's not, I'm not okay with that. Basically. Like I had to say, I'm not okay with her sitting at 200. Um, and so I did have to push back against that. And I did say, I'm okay with bringing it up to 180, but with the, you know, but with the understanding that she's going to be checked. And so it was a little bit of that, like, no, I'm not okay with this. I'm I'm meet you halfway here as long as this is also happening. See, you are so lovely because I probably in that same situation would have said, I want you to imagine many years from now, my daughter is 75 <laughs> yes, years right? old and um, she drops yes. dead, but she could have lived to 77, but you, the beeping was bothering you. And so <laughs> I would have said something completely. It, by the way, I go against everything I've said earlier in the podcast, which is don't be adversarial. But <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I want to be sure, clear. Scott. I, I was only adversarial uh, being serious in the office with the door closed with the superintendent like with yeah. the nurse i i completely understood the kid with the heart monitor i understood the situation completely it wasn't their fault it was a weird scenario um but that yes. was my point the entire time like right. you can't just leave this up to like hopefully that the nice lady remembers to call the class yeah, yeah. and you know we we had gotten her so stable and stuff before kinder heart, kindergarten happened and then like i was saying there's just so much change that has happened this year that we have the opposite problem. You know, we don't even really worry. We're not as have to, don't have to worry about the highs as much because we're constantly trying to figure out the lows. Mm -hmm. And I really think a lot of it, in addition to the changes that we've noted and the changes in our schedule and activity, a lot of it just has to do with her growing. We have noticed that with Annie, I think I, we talk a lot about, I hear a lot about high blood sugars with hormones. Um, we get kind of this weird thing where she'll go high, you know, at night. And we'll have to do a temp basil. And then she'll go low during the day. So I don't know if you've heard anyone else talk about that. But a lot of times when she's having a growth spurt for like a week or something, you know, she needs more insulin at night. But then during the daytime, we're fighting lows. It's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I it's, you just have to be flexible about it. Like when that happens, you, you know, you're going to have to. I mean, do, do the teachers have any um comfortable um uh, like can you set temp basils or, yeah or, yeah you're so there, right so I, I mean, yeah exactly yeah yourself, it's nice so. so i can just come in quickly do it or a couple times they've walked her down and i just set a temp basil and that helps out a lot what's frustrating i think one of the more frustrating things has been you know we'll notice a pattern we'll make changes in her pump and then you know, that'll be good for like a week. And then she'll kind of go back to her other, her other pattern. <laughs> yeah. So there's just a lot more of that this year. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been a lot more of a roller coaster. And I think just a lot of it, like I said, has to do with the amount of change, physical change that she's going through. Yeah, you're noticing and so I'm almost a lot of growth, almost, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm almost to a point where I'm noticing a pattern that I'm just setting a tent basils for like a week and mm -hmm. then just backing off of them again. Because I, every time I feel like every time I go in and change something in her pump, it's like a few days later that all of a sudden it's back to where it was. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, I think we did, we did have to bring down her carb ratios too. Like once we switched to the Omnipod, we had been bringing down her basal rates because she was constantly going low. And it was interesting because when you were looking at her line, it was just flat across the whole day, but skirting that low line. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she was getting a lot of uncovered carbs. And so we kept bringing down her basil thinking that that was it because she wasn't like having a huge crash. It was just like floating below. And then it they were ridiculously low at one point. I decided this can't like I if I give her any less basil, like, I just don't even like, I, let's try carb ratios. And that actually ended up helping quite a bit. But it was weird. It was kind of like almost reversed of what you would expect would need to happen. Well, there are, you know, there are people who manage two different ways. They like 
there's a lot of different ways to manage. You could manage um, good, solid basil that holds you nice and steady away from food, or you could be one of those people who uses less basil and crushes meals with a lot of insulin. Like, right. And to me, that's, I don't know if there's a right or wrong way. I mean, I guess it's obvious if you listen that I think the way to do it is to start with basil and then get your meals right. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, that comes from a lot of uh, MDI people, I think. Like, yeah. you know, like there's um, on MDI, a lot of times you'll have a heavier basil than you end up needing when you're on a pump. You don't realize it. And you're maybe you're just eating in the right times or you're feeding your lows or something like that. Um, but I can see how if you had stability and were and it wasn't crashing low that you might have thought basil for all. But that's really yeah. cool that you figured that out, too. <laughs> yeah, it's taking a lot of work. And it's I, again, it's like, we'll figure it out. And then uh, the other thing too, she got her COVID shots. So <laughs> you think about that, like she got her flu shot one week, next week she got her first COVID shot. And then two weeks later, she got her second COVID shot. I mean, between there too, like we had crazy numbers. So <laughs> basically pretty much from the time that she started in August, she had like a few weeks of really stable numbers. And then beyond that, we've just had so much change. And I think she, she, basically we're still working on getting her all figured out. And I, and I think a big change that I've seen with our team is um, less fear about the number. So um, I, she has an, an amazing teacher. He's really actually very interested in learning more about type one. He's actually started listening to a little bit of your podcast even because he just finds finds it fascinating yeah. um so we kind of scored there and <laughs> um he's just worked really hard to just know how to respond and he he's actually been able to predict kind of what how will the other good thing about the text message that is that they see the patterns and how we respond and so they get feel a little bit more confident in what they would do mm -hmm. you know what i mean so it's like i you know i've this is the number and then he'll guess kind of make a guess about what i'm going to say yeah. And see if he's right. So well, that's nice. the, their instincts are growing. I like that. That's a great way. That's how I do it with Arden, actually. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, just like, hey, what would you do here? That's when she was yeah. younger. Like, what do you think this is? Like, what do you think the right number is? How many carbs do you think this is? Like that stuff all is, um, it's a great way to learn this. Yeah. You know, that's excellent. Yeah, I know. That's been good. So I, I guess like my advice for my, you know, big takeaway advice from this. And like I said, by no means is this a perfect thing. We haven't got her totally stable. Um, we're still figuring it out. Oh, the other thing too, it's cold now. And the other thing to think about with COVID is that um, we have to keep windows and doors open. And we've had a super crazy winter here. It's been snowing and stuff. We've got snow on the ground right now, which is not normal for this time of year. And uh, it's freezing. So she's in a classroom and it's cold. And I think she's just like burning a ton with her body trying to stay warm Wait, too. I'm, I'm confused. You you have to open the windows because of COVID. Yeah. So with COVID, you want to keep airflow. Okay. So you have to like I turn up my heater and stuff. But the idea, of course, being that more airflow, the less likely that you're going to have an outbreak in your classroom. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. So my big takeaway for advice is just you know one thing is you know pack snacks. So we have packed two recess snacks. They have two recesses. The other kids just have one snack recess, but Annie always has snacks before her recesses. And, and we also pack a snack on P, for PE days, kind of like you were talking about how you, did, you know, just pump her full of a little extra carbs, which has been super important. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, you know, this system that I'm talking about, where we're on, on a thread, the benefits would be, you know, take some of the stress off of decision-making for the team, for the nurse and the teacher. There's increased communication. We always know how her day was, where she was at. So we don't, you know, don't even need to look at her data. Um, there's a much faster response time to her needs. So instead of having to go through the office or something, it's immediate. It feels like a team and it's easier for the team to kind of notice patterns and how, learn how to respond to her numbers based on how we respond to, you know, whatever texts they're sending to us. And it's also nice because the staff can input, inform, you know, suggestions too. So for instance, if my husband responds, all right, go ahead and, you know, cover her snack or whatever the nurse sometimes will pipe in and respond you know remind us hey just a reminder she's got music and they do a lot of jumping up and down in music and so i'll be like oh that's right let's let's keep leave two grams uncovered or something hmm. and so it's a nice little safety net and it feels like it's kind of going back and forth and um that we're all all have eyes on it together yeah and um, the challenges of that the, the, what we're doing of course you got to have a teacher who's on board and a staff that's on board um 
if there's tech issues, like sometimes her teacher, someone has gone to send a picture of it and it's not working or something, you know, usually that warrants a phone call. Well, it always warrants a phone call instead, which is not a big deal. And that, you know, the classroom teacher might feel overwhelmed or uncomfortable with an interruption to the day. And um, I think, again, that's where the teacher perspective comes into play, like recognize, just recognizing that they're, it, the, the classroom is so dynamic. And so it is very triggering to kind of hear feedback about numbers and alarms. Um, and also <clears throat> just try to imagine, like, try to imagine, like, being in a room trying to herd a bunch of kittens around <laughs> <laughs> while, like, something's on fire. Like, that's sometimes what teaching feels like. <laughs> And so, and then also having like this alarm going off, it's just a very, um, especially with young kids, there's a lot of needs. And um, so taking, you know, those deep breaths when you're having those conversations can be helpful. And um, I can can tell you that, you know, first of all, it's good to remember that when I'm talking about when Arden was younger at school, it was a really long time ago. Oh, yeah. Well, and like you said, no CGM, that's, that's scary enough. Yeah. Uh, well, even the idea of like, why couldn't the nurse set an alarm? The nurse couldn't set an alarm because cell phones didn't really exist. Right. Yeah. Oh my so, gosh. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> they didn't come for another year or so after that. Um, or just like snapping a picture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no, there was no taking pictures of anything and nobody had an iCloud account and a lot of stuff didn't exist. But, you know, what I can tell you that I think has been most valuable through the whole journey was that in the beginning we had some sort of of thing in place. And then if the thing didn't work, we adjusted it. And if the school was helping, that was great. And if they weren't, then I pushed back. But I did not push back just for the sake of pushing back. I pushed back when it was a dire situation. Right. There were plenty yeah. of little things that happened that I could have gotten upset about that I let go. Um, I think I left that school, um, that elementary school people liked Arden and didn't have a bad feeling about her or me, which I took as a great accomplishment. And why that was very important is because then when I went to the middle school to a new place and tried to explain to them all over again, this thing we'd been doing now for years that was working great at that point, they right away threw their hands up like, oh, that's not how we do it. But you know who I brought along to the meeting? I brought the school nurse from the elementary school who said, you should probably just listen to this guy. Yeah, And so I had a friend and I moved them along. And by the way, when Arden went from the middle school to the high school, the middle school nurse came with me and said the same thing to the high school nurse who immediately heard what we did and said, no, 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 we won't be doing that. And I went, oh, yeah, yeah, we we are. (laughs) And, uh, you know, and she's like, well, I I like to know the kids with type one. I want them to be in the room. I'm like, I don't care if you ever meet my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so like you, you're, there's this transition that always happens. And every year Mm -hmm. I would strip out any unnecessary stuff from the 504 because you're going to find mm-hmm. that the 504 plans when they're younger are overkill as they get older. And yeah, absolutely. I'm excited about that, actually. <laughs> yeah. And the reason that's important is because it gives the teachers less to be nervous about. Mm-hmm. So take away the stuff that doesn't matter as you're moving forward. And, you know, having snacks in every room or hidden around the school, you'd be surprised as they get older and older into, into high school what that turns into. Like, for the last handful of years, we take Listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. Arden takes in an Omnipod, an Omnipod, no insulin, a glucagon, four or five juice boxes, and some test strips. Like, I don't even know why we throw the test strips in there. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's to make the nurse comfortable. Right. Right. It's like the what if. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, go put this in because they're like, oh, we have a drawer for her. And I'm like, yeah, she's never going to come here. But that's nice. Right. And so like, here's some things to make you think I'm taking you seriously. And you and that makes them happy. Now, this is more 10th, 11th, 12th grade. And, you know, Arden's got a juice in her purse. Yes. That's the extent really of how we do it now. Although I will say this year as a senior, she has a teacher who pulled her aside and said, I bought a whole bunch of snacks and he opened up a drawer and he goes, these are for you. Oh. <laughs> and she, so she came home and she was really touched by that. She's like, he bought yeah. me like all kinds of food in case I get low. And, Sweet. you know, and one time this year it actually came up where Arden had a low that, that we couldn't fix with the juice and her options were go to the nurse and get the juices that we stashed there. Or I guess she has some in her car. She could have went and got, um, 
but she's like, I'm just going to go over to his class and grab yeah. like one of the snacks he has for me. It's really sweet. Yeah. So it just, it, it's going to morph. And yes, I mean, my best advice is, like I said, just settle up so that it works. You know, hope to hell you don't run into people who aren't going to be helpful because you have a, a really, you know, a great system there set up with great people. I've also interviewed people who the, you know, the teachers and the staff, they, they don't want to be involved at all. Mm-hmm. You know, right. And that, yes. that's a different problem, obviously. Yes. Mm-hmm. But at the end, yeah. it's communication and get get a system in place that works as well for your situation as you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess like the big thing, too, is just like expect, expect change. So <laughs> obviously, but sometimes dramatic change. Like I said, I mean, a lot has, for instance, when we, we went in thinking that we were going to be dosing for fat and protein still, we don't dose for fat and protein at all at school mm-hmm. because she just burns it off. You know, she's just running around like a banshee, just like playing like crazy. Yeah. When I when I see her at school on the playground, she is just red cheeked, huffing and puffing, like going crazy. So, and I, I think it probably also just depends on the kind of kid you have too. you know, not everyone is Annie, sure. um, but it, you know, I think just like realizing that those first months, possibly even up to first six months to a year, we're just collecting data and trying to figure it out and, um, and just expect some pretty big growth spurts at this time, you know, yeah. There's a lot of hormone fluctuations and that's been, that's been something that I didn't really expect. And, uh, <laughs> and again, just like I said, everyone's been very accepting of her. And so if you have any anxiety about your kiddo starting out, it, it really isn't as scary as you would think it is. <laughs> Everyone goes to school. It'll be okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. And hormones. Wait till she gets her period. Oh my God. <laughs> I know. I, I'm dreading it. I'm laughing at you right now. What do you think of that? <laughs> I know. I know. Seriously. I think about that too. I'm like, gosh, this is just kindergarten. Um, one interesting thing. I know we're close to the end of time. You're we cool. had, we did have a slip up on our end. Um, we had, you know, we should, we, we put sticky notes on her lunch with the total on it. My husband had, written you know 32 grams on her lunchbox but he had accidentally like looped the end of the three and so it kind of looked like an eight so i was in class and i look at the at her uh, cgm and she is just tanking like dropping i'm like what is happening and they had dosed her for 82 instead of 32 see now that's interesting to me the nurse didn't notice that one day suddenly she was getting four times. Well, this was forth? in the very beginning. This okay. was literally right, right. like first lunch. Gotcha. Oh. <laughs> so, and they don't have any perspective, right? At yeah. that oh, point. Oh, at that point. Okay. I understand. At that point, they don't. They notice the pattern over time. Like right. now, if that had happened again, they would have been like, hey, too, that's like way different, right? Mm. But at that point, they don't. And as a matter of fact, you know, we have kids who, when the nurse was talking to me about this later, she was saying, everyone's different. Like every, type one eats differently. So you get some kids who they might actually eat 82, sure. you know, grams of carbs in a sitting. So it's not really, they don't, they have no reference. Yeah. So just be really kind of, you know, clear about. I understand. Uh, hey, did the, cops have, <laughs> did the cops have to come when you beat your husband when you got home or did you? Did you... <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I actually, I felt so, I felt so bad for the team. I, <laughs> I've never seen her, her teacher look so just, just hang dog. So down. I felt so, I actually felt like, are you okay? Because he was just so worried. It was, it was just, right. it it was like, this will never happen again. (laughs) I was like, well, it won't on our end either. But really when they showed me the sticky note, I was like, oh no, that totally looks like an eight. (laughs) Yeah. My husband will never make this mistake again because his hands are broken and he can't write. So well, and her and her teacher made a joke like, you know, I can send home some handwriting sheets for him, oh, <laughs> which I thought was that. pretty funny. Oh, you should definitely still do that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> right. Should have put some in his stockings. Yeah. Should you practice your cursive <laughs> on these dotted lines? Right. <laughs> Trying to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's been good. It's just been, um, like I said, you know, a lot of me kind of having to step back and, and reminding myself not to be judgmental of the journey either. And just recognizing like, man, we've been through a ton of stuff this year. Sure. And of course, her blood sugars are going to be and need some 
kind of constant adjustment right now and just being okay with that. And so I'm just going to say this to everybody listening. If you think that your insulin isn't going to need constant adjustment through your life with diabetes, you're fooling yourself. Well, I think that's also part of it though, too, right? Is that I'm like, I'm, I feel this pressure to kind of get her to be like perfectly even throughout the whole day. And then I, because I feel like, like it's just crazy. And um, then there's the other part of me that's like, but she's always going to need adjustment. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I guess that's where I'm at in this journey is me trying to see what normal looks like at school because it is different now. So I'm trying to find the new normal and trying to get her to the most stable spot. And I'm just starting that journey of seeing like, what is a a pattern of like how often I'm actually having to make changes. So that's where I'm, I'm very much a newbie. Yeah. Yeah. Just be careful that you, that you don't forget that your new normal might only last for three weeks. So, okay. Yeah. So basically what I'm hearing you say is this is normal. Yeah. This is, and this is, this was Arden in school. Yeah. Like she was constantly needing adjustments. You're, so you, you're, because you're newer at it and you're just seeing this for the first time, you're just, you're seeing the same things I saw. You're thinking about them backwards of how I would think of them. So you're, you're seeing she needs more, she needs less activity. Like, how do I find normal? Where do I get this? So it's on like autopilot again. And right. I, I don't think about diabetes like that. Like, okay. I just think it's going to change and you just, you just adjust with it. So okay. there are days when she'll need more and days when she'll need less and you just give her more or less. Um, okay. And then, That's yeah. helpful for me good. because yeah. I just feel like, man, am I just not doing a good job with this? Because like I said, before she went into school, it was pretty, like, I didn't really think about it that much. Listen, and even when she's at home, yeah, I don't really think about it that much well, yeah, because, um, because she's, you found the pattern that worked yeah. at home. Right. But you, school is such a dynamic place. Like I said, yeah, there's but, more going on and there's, and those are all variables for yeah. diabetes and a so lot of them variables. happening at once too. Right. right. Exactly. Here, okay. Here's how it I helps would, me just to hear that. Yeah. I would judge. Here's how I would judge your success or failure. It, not to use words that some people don't like, but I, I have a limited vocabulary. So, um, <laughs> so here it is. How frequently does her blood sugar get into an emergency low situation where you're in a panic? Well, it depends this year more often than uh, normal. A week, and I though. guess it depends on the week. In a week, uh, I mean, like I said, we've had so many variables, but um, I would say in a week, she like the week before we left for school, she was getting there probably like once a day. Okay, so like she, a panic, a panic being that she's got a low. What, what, so her low alarm low goes off at 75 Okay, so you're to pan- give us time to respond. Right. So that's not panic, right. but if it, but panic as in maybe she's like 66 trending down no, and okay. she's like on the playground or something. Here's the thing. I would adjust your theories about panicking and then that would be one thing that would help. So I think you're doing good there. What's her A1C? Um, her last day when she was 6.3. Nice. And how frequently do you think she's over 180? Um, well, she's been going high at night. We just started sending 10 basils. The last week she's been going high at night, like every night. And we just were like, just set the 10 basils. So that has What's taken hot? care what of What do you it. mean high? What put a number on high? high for her is 140. Okay. You're doing great. There, I told you. <laughs> You're doing okay. fantastic. So your kid has had diabetes for a couple of years, just started school. Um, you had you were living through COVID, so there was a lot of like stability because there, there were far fewer variables. You've introduced a ton of new variables. You have a low 6A1C. She doesn't get emergently low more than a couple of times a week, and you don't normally go over 140? Well... She'll go over 140. Her high alarm goes over 140. But yeah, no, but I get your point. Yeah, yeah, We're doing yeah. all right. You're doing great. Yeah. And okay. you and all right, good. I, listen, I'm gonna say something to you that I end up saying to a lot of people more privately than on the podcast, but I'll say it here. Your desire to do well is why you're going to do well. Yeah. Yeah. It just it just takes time. You need to have these experiences. They have to happen kind of over and over again so that they start to make sense to you so that you're not chasing them around, but more making meaningful adjustments. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's, listen, Arden didn't seem to feel well yesterday. This is a Christmas break. She was just very kind of like laying around quiet. Um, 
she had food that I thought we bolus pretty well for. And then suddenly it just, it got away from her and, and it got, and she tried to bolus like before I got to her and it just didn't happen. Like her blood sugar went up to like 200 and it sat there and we crushed yeah. it and it just went up more. Yeah. Uh, so, I've been, I, that's happened to us recently too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it took me a minute to go, okay, like, I don't know what happened here, but I can't be making incremental adjustments to this. I have to put, throw a lot of insulin at this to fix this. Mm-hmm. And, and I did. And will that happen today? Probably not, you know, but <laughs> it, it, but it might. And if it does, I'll do it again. But, but what I was good at was pivoting. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't get stuck in, oh, this should be working. I got right. stuck. I, I was like able to look and go, this doesn't work. Do something different. Yeah. And, and fix it. There's been a lot more of that this year where I have no clue why she is the number that she is. Like, I'm just like, this is unexplainable right now. Yeah. But we'll just deal with it. But it's just, it's, I think it's been a weird year that way. And I guess I'm, I guess it's a little like a little baby prelude, prelude to puberty, but cause I know that it's like crazy pants yeah. <laughs> around puberty just, time with, with blood sugar numbers. Yeah. But I, I can, I can understand like why, you know, it's just, it's frustrating when they're going through a lot of change hormonally too, just cause you're like, okay. <laughs> I guarantee so. that two years from now, well, that's unfair because this might take six months to come out. Let's say three years from now. Like, say three years from now, if you go back and listen to this again, you won't recognize the person on this recording. Yeah, I'm very interested. That'll be yeah. So, but I think this 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 even helps though. Like course. hearing it because, like I said, we don't have anyone to really compare to. Yeah. No, I understand. Listen, part of my job is just like, like you know, you know, when the coach like slaps you on the butt when you run out in the field, and you're like, go get him. You're doing great. You know, and he and yeah. you and you run away, and he's like, "Oh, this guy's falling apart." But like, it's his job. They go like, "You're doing great." Sometimes it's my job to tell you you're doing great because y- you are, and you don't know it because you have nothing to compare it to, and it feels like an utter failure because you had such crazy stability earlier on. Now, who knows if it was she was more sedentary because of COVID, or maybe she was honeymooning a little bit and you didn't realize it. Yeah, like, like there's yeah. all kinds of things that could happen. But if you keep assessing her if you assess her basal and remember that she's going to keep growing and as she gains weight she's going to need more insulin um if you keep doing that you're going to be fine the biggest favor you could do for yourself is to stop to stop expecting that you're going to find like the place mm-hmm. where it's all the sweet gonna, spot yeah 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 there's there's no sweet spot so far that i can find and arden okay I, I mean, okay arden's had diabetes for 15 i don't know hold on a second two, seven, yeah, like 15 years. And okay. um, the amount of times where I've sat back and gone, I've got it. It's over. <laughs> it's very <laughs> infrequently. So yeah. yeah okay. That, that actually helps me. I feel like I can remind myself to put that one down a little more then. Yeah. And if it gets to be too much for you, just walk into the woods and uh, yeah. don't, don't go home. <laughs> Perfect. I have yeah. a lot of, you know, woods around here. So. Yeah, I just wander in a direction and then uh, tell your husband, like, I, I'm, I'm done. Goodbye. And mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> Did all I can do. Can't do no more. I got to go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now you're going to be, ter- you're one of those people who's going to be terrific. Um, but you just have to stop fighting with reality. Yeah. That's all. That's helpful to know. And I'll carry that one with me. Good for you. I, I listen. It's a hard adjustment to make because it feels like it feels like it's a problem that you're going to solve instead yeah. of a life you're going to live. <laughs> and mm. it, it is just not. Listen, you know, Arden's had diabetes for a really long time, and just the other day, I found myself getting in the shower and thinking, "This is not what I thought my life was going to be like." Yeah, and um, I I felt sad about it for a minute it's yeah. not it's not what i thought her life was going to be like i don't want any of this to be in my life like i don't want this for her um but there's no amount of hoping or that's going to change that so you might as well figure out how to do it well you know? yeah and that's a big push for me is that like you know i don't i don't want to i need to see me responding um in a very like negative emotional way to her numbers you know Mm -hmm. because i really want to model for her like it's a number and this is what we do next you know and um and i think that that's also one really great thing about her team is that they're all really really positive um even amidst that yeah you know chaos so i I think that that's 
probably one of the biggest things that, that I'm taking from this conversation too, is just reminding myself of that goal. Yeah. Good for and, you. Listen, uh, um, try to keep your variability lower. So not as much up and down. Mm-hmm. Um, don't be feeding basil, you know, don't be feeding lows. Um, you know, pre bolus your meals, you know, try to stop lows before they happen without causing rebound highs. It's pretty much it. Just timing yep. an amount on the insulin and just the rest of it is not getting sucked into the, um, into that other stuff. <laughs> the whirlpool. Yeah. yeah where, where you're just constantly worried and anxious and concerned that you're doing a bad job. Like, like that, that you thought putting up her alarm at school was an indication that you didn't know what you were doing tells me you have a lot of like personal stuff to work out around it. Yeah, for you sure. Know? Yeah. So a little therapy wouldn't hurt, you know? Yeah. yeah that's all. Uh, Very true. Very yeah, true. Do your thing. Um, are we good? Did you, did we talk about everything that you wanted? Yeah, to? I think, I think I, I think I said all the things that I wanted to say. Excellent. And I hope it's helpful to people who are starting the journey themselves. So I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I think it was really helpful. And I'm being texted by my children who are like, you said you would cook 20 minutes ago. So. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your podcast and your time. So thank you. Thank you. By the way, they can cook for themselves. This is oh. <laughs> you know, it's just laziness. Um, they'll sit next to me while I'm cooking and be like, oh, right. look, look at them cooking. Their backseat cooking. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Oh, they will do that too. You don't do this right. I'm like, just take the thing and do it yourself. Eh. <laughs> it tastes as good that way. Mm. Yeah. The only <laughs> mistake you made was having kids. Other than that, you're doing great. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's a different path. That's for sure. Yeah, I just, just think 20 <laughs> years from now, you might be making them eggs and they, while they critique that your eggs are too moist. Right. <laughs> right. In my cooking class, they said. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Because they know anything. Trust me. Right. <laughs> this isn't going to end. And it would have just been something else if it wasn't diabetes. So don't feel like you were like, seriously, you would just be upset about something different. Right. Right. <laughs> anyway, I really do appreciate you doing this. Will you hold on for one second for me? Of course. Yeah. Thanks. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. And to get your free benefits check from US Med, go to usmed.com forward slash juice box or call 888 721 15. One four. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. Before I go, I'm just going to apologize for the reference I used at the beginning of the of the show. I've done a little checking. The uh, Mandrell sisters are in their late sixties and early seventies, and Lawrence Welk has been dead for three decades. And so I'm realizing that the reference I used was from my childhood, which was forty some years ago. Anyway. I hope you enjoyed the program.